Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, again, this is a supplemental lecture for the GIS for Geoscientists workshop sponsored by VMSG, and I'm your host, Nick Barber. This is going to be the last supplemental lecture for the course. Uh, there have been quite a few of these throughout our time, and the goal of this supplemental lecture is to wrap up the filmed recordings of exercise number one that we began all the way back in lecture number two. The goal today is to highlight how we actually make a map now that we have created our different layers, performed our analyses, and we have the data that we want out of it. So a lot of this is going to be centered on design elements and intricacies within what's called the layout manager within QGIS. The tasks at hand are these specific tasks shown here. I'm going to show you how to bring in all these different elements. And before I do that, I'm going to introduce some of the symbology or visualization elements that go into making these layers look the way that I have rendered them. So with that in mind, pardon me, my email was open. <laughs> um, so with that in mind, this is my map. Should make Q a bit smaller. This is my map, and I am more than certain that it looks quite different than what you have open on your screen, and that's fine. I'll explain how we get here very briefly in a moment. So let's first go through what layers we need to make our map, keeping in mind that our map in this case looks like this. It has these lahar layers, these ash isopacks. It has boundaries drawn on that we now know, thanks to our work with exercise number one, correspond to cantons or parochias in Ecuador that are affected by the different hazards. And we have Quito labeled here as well. And you see there's a bunch of other information on this map. For instance, we have very critically this box down here that actually gives us some information on how many people we have estimated from our analyses are at risk. This is the result of our overlap analysis and statistical summary. We have our CRS information so people can replicate this and know for certain which projection system we're using. And actually to make this even more accurate, I could have included the EPSG reference code. They can be sure they're using the right surgas projection system. There's also a scale bar. There's a north arrow. There's a legend that, um, that highlights in detail all the different layers that are available. And also usefully, there's this inset map that shows where we are in Ecuador in this little red box, which shows the boundaries of the country and adjacent countries um, to situate where we are in the world for someone who's not familiar. So this is a lot of information contained in this map. And what I promised you at the beginning of this course is that by the end, you would be able to perform all the analyses you need to make this map, and you would be able to make this map yourself. And I'm going to do my best to hold to that today. So how we start with this is we first want to load in the proper layers. So we know we need, first and foremost, the layers I've called Lahar Clift and the ash isopack, these are going to be some of the most important layers we have loaded in. Now, in terms of the symbology for these, this is where we can start to experiment with how these things look. Uh, in the case of the hard clip, you'll notice that it's a brown layer and has this sort of shading to it. It almost looks like there's kind of a lit up spot, a spotlight placed here um, that sort of fades out to darker brown colors as we get further away from the centroid at this point. This is a product of the symbology choices that I've made for this particular sample. And it just so happens that I have decided to add a what's called a gradient um, to, this, to this particular sample for no other reason than to highlight the different aesthetic choices we can make with these layers. I've decided now that, that I don't really like this. Uh, this is something I can go back and add in again if, if I want. But if I hit this remove symbol layer option, or if I simply go back by default and get a default symbol setting here. One moment, having some technical issues. Oh, 
apologies for that. Uh, what I want to do here, perhaps I want to do something like this, have a simple fill like this, and stroke color. I want to have a black line, perhaps with a sort of a bold outline. All I'm doing here by selecting single symbol and adjusting the fill is I'm adjusting, just like I would in something like Adobe Illustrator or in Inkscape, I'm adjusting the actual underlying color of the of, that's filling in the polygon, and the stroke is referring to the boundary of the polygon here. I click apply, I click OK, and you'll see that the appearance of Rohars has changed drastically. If I inspect the ash layers and inspect their symbology, you'll notice again these are polygons, and what I've gone for here is an empty fill but I've used this dot line option here under the stroke style. So there's a range of different ways you can render these uh, vector layers aesthetically. The other vector layers we're going to need to make this map come from, uh, come from the QGIS folder. I believe they're under the GIS base layers area. Uh, these are uh, respectively called, if we zoom out and I turn off the DEM, the regional affected area in yellow, the affected area Guagua Pachincha in orange, and Quito highlighted in red. And this color scheme, red, orange, yellow, is sort of the color scheme that I've settled on as being, for at least my purposes for analysis, as being the parochias, the underlying cantons that reflect uh, which areas of the country are most under threat from particular eruptive products. So for instance, in the yellow zone, these are parochias that while uh, they certainly will be exposed to ash hazards. Those ash hazards will be comparatively less extreme than those faced by the cantons and parochias located in the central region in the orange and most probably in the red zone. The reason we classify Quito as its own red zone, quote unquote, is because of its population density um, and the amount of lahar coverage that would be expected to affect Quito in the event of a 10th century eruption. So if we load in these three layers that I'm highlighting on my screen here, then you'll have access to all of these. And again, just like with the other layers, if you wanted to, you could adjust the colors of these. You could decide to classify them as something different than red, orange, and yellow. You could choose to use a fill rather than a simple line boundary like this. It all just depends on what your, your preference would be in this case. The next bit is quite minor, but something that, again, if I, if I double check in the folder, should still be available, is hopefully something that you will have access to. Master Tracer, DMs. This might be something I have to go back and add to the GitHub to make sure that, that you have access to this. Ah, nope, we're good. We don't have to worry about this, I think. Yes. So only problem is it's not showing up properly when I drop this in. Ay, ay, ay. Okay. There we go. Yes. So under the hazard folder in the QGIS download where all the data is, there's a shape file called guagapachincha.shp. And this is a point file corresponding to the rough approximate location of the modern crater of Guagapachincha. You'll see here that I've actually rendered this as a small red triangle in terms of symbology. If I right click on that, select properties, you can see that I've actually gone to quite a great lengths to affect this in a, uh, to make sure that this triangle renders in the exact way that I want it. Um, we don't have to worry too much about these here. We'll save that. We may not have time to talk about what I'm doing here uh, in this particular, uh, unfortunately in this workshop, it goes a bit beyond what we're able to talk about here. But just keep in mind that you can affect shape as well, particularly with point um, shape files, point geometry shape files. 
So here's the fill color, the stroke color. And then I have the option to load in different geometric points, shapes um, for these, for this layer here. What you'll notice that's potentially quite pleasing to you is this lovely label that pops out, has a shadow behind it, a white box. It's something that very immediately calls out what this feature is referring to. Um, and it's a label. Labels are something that deserve probably their own, they could have up to an hour lecture in, Q, in QGIS uh, or really any GIS. Labeling is a surprisingly frustrating process in GIS. And it's something that like, like with a lot of what I've talked through in this course is something that after I introduce to you, I encourage you to explore on your own. Built into QGIS is a labeling function. It's this ABC tool you see highlighted here on my toolbar. Um, so you can click on any layer that has attributes with particular features that you could use to label. So for instance, if I were to turn on this population census layer, go to properties, you can see that I can turn on single labeling for this layer and I can choose the particular attribute in the vector file that I want to use as my label field. And there are a lot of different options for how I render this layer. So for instance, uh, sorry, this label. So I could have, for instance, the font that I select, the font size, the color. I could have a buffer added to it, a mask, a background, set a shadow, have a call out so it sort of jumps out like the Guagua Pachincha label I have does. Um, an algorithm, I can, I can sort of choose which algorithm I want for the QGIS to decide how to handle conflict. Because the first thing you'll notice when you try to label sort of a really rich series of polygons or points in QGIS is that there are gonna be conflicts where labels are gonna to try to overlap. And you have to specify um, using these algorithms by default, you know, how QGIS is gonna handle those conflicts. And frankly, QGIS and ArcMap, both, soft, both major GIS softwares have trouble handling this by default. What's really great about Q though is the fact that it's, QGIS is community driven and there are community driven solutions to some of these problems. And in the case of labels, one of the plugins I asked you to install was Easy Custom Labeling. And this is an, a fantastic tool, something that has saved me so much time and made my map so much better. Um, once I've identified a layer that I want to add an easy, easy custom label to, I select that layer in the layer dialog. I click the easy ABC button after installing the plugin, or I could go to the drop down here. And it asks me to provide a label field. Um, in this case, this is an attribute that I want to do the labeling with. And for this particular layer, I haven't added any further metadata on the uh, name of this feature. So I'm just going to go with the default ID feature, which is just going to be a numeric code. It might be hard for you to see at this scale, but a number one has just rendered right in the middle of this red triangle. That's not ideal for a label. And if I didn't use this plugin, I would have to sort of tweak in the properties dialog, um, which algorithm and sort of what call out distance I'm gonna place this, the font size, and I'd have to continually be iterating that and it wouldn't be very interactive, wouldn't be very user friendly. You also notice that as soon as I start labeling something, it creates this, uh, it puts me in edit mode with a new feature uh, that essentially becomes a labeling layer. Another critical um, plugin that I ask you to, to save is Memory Layer Saver. What this does is it preserves certain scratch layers, uh, temporary scratch layers, um, to make them permanent between sessions. And this is particularly valuable for easy custom labeling because the outcome of easy custom labeling are these very unique file formats that aren't a shape file, that aren't a raster. They are uh, essentially label files. And critically, they're stored. They will be deleted at the end of a session if you don't have this memory layer saver plugin enabled. At least that's been how my experience has gone in, in using QGIS. So you have to have two plugins to do this right. Once you have them both installed, though, things go smoothly. And I can actually click this to see which thing I'm preserving. So once I've enabled easy custom labeling for Guagua Pachincha, I get access to this toolbar here, which should pop in as soon as you install the easy custom labeling plugin. And 
If I mouse over these tools, you can see I can pin and unpin labels and diagrams. I can show and hide label and diagram, move a label or diagram, rotate a label, or change label properties. Let's try moving this. I want this one to be somewhere way away from the rest of the data. And look at that, already this interactive ability to manually move layers, this is a godsend and it makes the rest of the label editing process so much more uh, straightforward, basically. Let me try to edit the properties of this particular layer. And this is again, where easy custom labeling makes things so easy. So I could call this Guagua Pachincha. I could call this Volcano. I could call this whatever I'd like. Let's make it bold, apply, there we go. We have a text label there. Now, if I really wanted to get more detailed and add other features like this, this background box that you see, I could do so. Uh, in this case, for some reason, it's not rendering at the moment. Um, but the, the point being that uh, once you once you enable the Easy Custom Labeling plugin, you can start making much more detailed choices about how you're going to go about labeling. Uh, and in my case, this label Guaco Pachincha layer uh, is is rendered in such a way that it's going to make it look really nice on the map. That was a bit of an aside about label rendering. We've talked about labels now, vector symbology, and now I want to give you a quick crash course on DEMs. So remember DEMs are representing the topography of this area. Um, I've specifically only downloaded two SRTM files corresponding roughly to the orange and red zones here, not encompassing the whole of the yellow zone. So we're gonna kind of zoom in and, and ignore some of those further away yellow zone um, parochias because we have been told to focus mainly on this area in this exercise. Uh, and also it just sort of means that you don't have to download as much data. If you wanted to get these SRTMs yourself, remember you can use the SRTM downloader plugin. You can set the canvas extent and by clicking this download button, you can download these DEMs raw straight from the Earth Data source yourself, um, provided that you have an Earth Data account and you log into it when you open this tool. Now, by default, the DEMs you load in, the DEM merge in Hillshade will not look exactly like this. In fact, your DEM merge.tif file this is going to be a black and white file by default, and the hill shade is probably going to have different rendering of the underlying topography. So you might be asking yourself then, how did I get this to look like this? And, and why, why are we rendering the topography in this way? Um, so it really, it, this is a trick I learned after experimenting this for years and years, trying to figure out a way to make topography look nice. By default, Topography may look something like this. Uh, and I'm just gonna sort of go in, I'm gonna adjust some stuff that I'm gonna go back to later. You know, by default, topography might look something like this. Um, in this case, Uh, da, da, da. Sorry, I'm just sort of experimenting with some of these. So if I zoom out, or I hit OK, sorry, it doesn't like having the property window open. You know, yours may not look something exactly like this. I'm using the grays palette here. In fact, let me just fix that. I don't think, I think the issue, ah, uh, yes, the issue is I'm using, let's go back to single band gray. There we go. That looks a bit better. So it still looks a, a bit strange. Um, well, it doesn't look like yours by default. That's all I was trying to replicate is what yours probably looks like by default. And I think I just cracked on, on what the issue is. Yes, it is the transparency. There we go. Okay, this is probably what yours looks like by default. If I turn off all the other vector layers, you know, you'll notice that while it's an interesting layer, it's it's not very detailed. Um, and particularly, we don't really get a sense for the degree of relief, the, the changes in slope in particular areas. Even when we have this other geological information, it's it's not very detailed. 
So a trick I learned to make topography really pop in QGIS, for lack of a better term, um, is to overlay a the raw sort of DEM SRTM file rendered as a raster pseudo color with what's called a hill shape. And if I go, in order to make a hill shape layer, you simply go into the processing toolbox, type in hill shape, and you find this under the raster terrain analysis tool set. And all a hill shape is, is it's a, it's a visual rendering of a raster. It's still a raster layer uh, that's rendered as if the sun is being directed on this landscape at a particular angle and at a particular height with respect to the land surface. And it casts shadows in the image rendering that make it appear, trick your eye into uh, recognizing a sort of 3D structure. And, and this is essentially what's happening here. So you have access to both of these layers, the DM merge, the DM hill shade. And what really helps in visualizing the terrain is to essentially stack these two. And we do this in uh, sort of a, a very, we can do this in a number of different ways, but the basic procedure, once you've made a hillshade layer, or in this case, once you've downloaded it, and if you need to make one from scratch for your analyses, you can do so here. All the work is done essentially in the DEM merge layer, and you take advantage of symbology properties um, that are mainly available under the single band pseudo color uh, layer. Um, what the pseudo color option does under symbology for raster is it allows you to pick a color ramp and define how you want these different colors to be rendered for the whole area. So in this case, I want to make sure that I'm rendering this in a way that looks nice. Now, the color map I've chosen here called Oleron, it's a scientific color map by Fabio Crameri. I talked about this in my uh, lecture number three. It's a great open source colorblind friendly uh, color map database that uh, you know maybe isn't useful for every application, but in this case uh, will make for nice data eventually. Um, and what you see, <laughs> What you see me doing right now essentially is trying to do what I shouldn't do and that's playing with this live but in some ways hopefully it gives you a sense of some of the different ways that you yourself can can sort of make these changes so let's go with I'm just going to try to pick a color map that I'm happy with in the end Let's go with this. And once we're happy with the color that we're using, or we could go even simpler, we could go for something just like this blue green here. There we go, that looks nice. So we have this sort of bluish green to yellow color map here, broken down by equal interval. I would encourage you to explore these different options for how you break down the different classes in raster symbology. This is something, again, I don't have time to explain in this short video. Um, but I encourage you to explore it and sort of dive into the documentation a bit if you're trying to understand why you choose equal interval over continuous. It sort of basically it just changes where you place the boundaries between different uh, groups. The trick now is to, first of all, make this layer a bit transparent. So already that looks a bit nicer. We have these colors that are corresponding to the actual underlying topography. But we can actually improve this even further by using what's called blending. And what this does is by specifying the type of blending we want to use, when the transparent layer on top uh, is rendered with the transparent raster layer on bottom, the blending mode we select sort of tells the software how to uh, make that image appear. And one that has worked for me before has been the hard light. I find that, at least for me, using the hard light blending mode has the effect of sharpening the boundaries in the hill shade. And that makes the boundaries between the different color zones really stand out quite remarkably. Uh, the reason I was trying to use the Oleron uh, band earlier was because when done right, here we go, 
And this is what I was trying to replicate earlier. You see, eventually I get it right. Um, when the Oleron band is rendered in hard light with an equal interval spacing, uh, eight or you know eight to ten classes, um, and it's given some degree of transparency, the the final rendered product of the merged file over the hillshade file gives you this nice, soft, and almost sort of realistic seeming um, color scheme for the underlying topography. If I turn the hazard layers back on, then this is sort of a this is a great starting point for interpreting what's going on uh, below the surface. Now, I shouldn't say below the surface. What's what's going on in the map? <laughs> it's late, so I as I'm recording this, so um, my mouth is running away with me. What I've just done is given you a whirlwind tour of vector symbology, label placement, and raster symbology. This is by no means completely exhaustive. Um, I do discuss this in, in, uh, to some degree of detail in the QGIS guide, but frankly, these design elements are something that can't be explained or taught in the same way that the analytical procedures, the theory, the way ethics or the way programming can. These, these are tools that really come from what your preferences are for appearance. And all I've done here right now is just to show you what these options are. In session four, when we pick up in our final lecture where we left off uh, this past week, the week of November 16th, um, I will touch on symbology again. I'll show you some more advanced tools that go into to visualizing particular layers, but already by rendering the underlying DEMs, manipulating the vector layers and showing you how labeling works I've ticked the boxes, given you the basic tools you need to start manipulating symbology on your own. And the number one tip I have for figuring out how to make these layers look the way you want, to how to get better at visualizing these layers is to experiment. You need to go into the symbology layer levels for each of the different layers you wanna manipulate. And you want to experiment with every single button, every single drop down menu and see what, for instance, different blending modes, how that affects your underlying DEM rendering. That is my advice to you for this. Um, and hopefully this gives you a good starting point for that. So once we have the layers set up, we basically have everything we need to go and make a map. And that's what we're all here for, hopefully. Hopefully the end goal for a lot of you is to make a map that you can then either put in a figure, a grant report, uh, a, a, a project or presentation for, for your work, um, that's hopefully the end goal for all of us. And the way that we do this um, and, and include elements like a scale bar, like a north arrow, the things that we talked about in the PDF I showed you at the beginning of this video is we access what's called the layout manager. So keep in mind that this whole thing we're working in here is called the map canvas. It does have display elements. We can add things like a decoration. We can add something like a north arrow here. And look at that, there's a North Arrow rendering. But by default, you will find that there's no real option to export this as anything other than a .qgz file or some sort of geo package or Postgres file, not something that you could you know, put in a paper, for instance, or put in a report. Um, so you have to go to this whole separate window that essentially is Built, design built for map creation and layout management called the layout manager. So if I click the layout manager and drag this over to you, you'll notice that there's a couple, because I've done this many times before, there's a lot of different layout windows that I can manipulate here. Um, to start, I'm going to open one I've already started for this, for, for this VMSG course. Um, called VMSG 2021. And so when you do this for the first time, the only option you're going to have is to define your own layout. Um, so I would encourage you to click the create dot, 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 and then to save your own layout template for this particular project. Critically, the layout um, that you use for a map is going to be tied to the project file. So in this case, my workshop exercise.qgz file. Um, so, uh, uh, adds extra impetus to make sure you're saving a project file when you're doing analyses 
because when you go to make the map, the associated layout gets connected to that in, in the project phase with option. So if I open this, you can see I've already started doing the work for you here. Um, I am going to delete it and show you how to do this from scratch though, so, so don't you worry. In fact, I'm going to delete, delete this right now just so we can start from scratch. This is what the layout manager looks like. It's essentially, like I said, it's basically just for processing um, and creating uh, visually appealing images and maps um, that will then go on to potentially be edited in other graphic design softwares. There's a lot of different options here. And like with everything, I encourage you to explore these. Look at the tool tips, read the documentation, try to figure out what these different tools can add to your analysis, what they can do for you. I can say I've used probably about 50% of the tools in the layout manager. There's a lot of hidden features that are really useful that I'm gonna to try to highlight. But there's a few key things that I wanna make sure you come away from this course knowing how to do. The first is adding an item. <laughs> and this is thankfully very easily labeled. Um, there are a range of different options shown here. And the first thing we wanna do is add a map, right? So if you select this option, or you really you select any of these options, you get a cursor that shows up. And if I click, well, something weird happens, right? So what I actually do with this add map is I draw a box. And within that box, what's going to be rendered is whatever is showing up on my map canvas as we speak. So here we go. This is our map layer. And you see it's already been put into this items uh, layer over here. This is kind of like our layers uh, menu, our layers panel in the map canvas. It's showing the different layout items or elements that, I'm, that I want to display and the order I want to display them in. And then below this, what renders is an item property. This is basically a, an expansion of the underlying uh, properties of this particular map layer. Um, and it's here where a lot of the fun work gets done on editing, say, um, well, as I'll show in a moment, how to add, for instance, a lat long grid or uh, an inset map or an overview panel or editing a legend is, is done in this item properties menu where you can manipulate any aspect of the imported layout item. Okay, so we've imported the map. Now, what's funny about the layout manager, uh, and this is always the case, is when you first bring this in, it doesn't necessarily render to the same scale and the same position as you've shown on your QGIS. And this is for a number of reasons. Um, so what we can do is if you look on the sidebar here, there's a number of tools, some will be familiar to you, like pan, there's a zoom option, there's a select option to select different map elements or items. But then there's a move item content option, to scroll with a couple arrows. And if I use this, what this actually allows me to do, which is really helpful, is it allows me to zoom in and out, or it's, I, sorry, to actually pan the underlying map data to the extent that I want. Um, if I use the zoom, you see it doesn't actually zoom into the map canvas itself. Um, all it actually does is zoom into, for instance, the, the item, the particular item that, that I'm concerned with. If I want to, if I want to actually affect, you know, if I want to zoom in on this orange area, for instance, what I can do is I can use the zoom tool here. I can zoom in on that a bit closer. And then under the item properties, I can select these these orange boxes here selecting set map extent to match main canvas extent allows this map item grid to essentially snap to what my main map is looking like this looks a lot nicer this is more what we want to to focus on you know if i wanted to even further zoom in again i could zoom in a bit further here and then i could go back to the layout you see a lot of this layout management is going to be quite iterative um, then I could drag this up, get this centered a bit better. Once I'm happy with that, then I'm good to go on the rest of the analyses. Now, some of these elements that we want to add, for instance, the North Arrow scale bar, they're actually quite easy to add. And the fun comes in in deciding how you want them to look. So for instance, with the North Arrow, just like with the map element, I'm going to drag it, I'm going to create a box. And what's going to be rendered inside is some sort of 
um, arrow. By default, yours might look a bit different than mine. Um, if I select the north arrow here, just keeping in mind that my computer is a bit slow, it's, it's running Zoom, the recording feature, as well as uh, QGIS, <laughs> which could crash at any moment. Um, rendered here are going to be a range of different North Arrow options, as well as some other SVG files uh, associated with particular map elements we might, we might want to denote. Um, let's say, for instance, I want this particular geometry or I want this particular geometry. There are, are a number of different North Arrow options made available to me by default. Um, I personally really like this sort of Star Trek looking one. Um, it's very simple, it's very clean. That's just my preference. Um, but again, you just you just add item and you add this, and essentially this is an image object that gets added, some sort of SVG element. Next, we could add a scale bar. And this is where the fun really starts to kick off because this is where we can start um, editing and sort of really fine tuning how we want things to look. Um, so you can see once I add the scale bar, it gets added at the top here and it becomes the highlighted element because it's the one that I'm editing in the item properties menu here. First thing it asks is which map am I referring to? And this is key. When you add elements in the layout manager that are dependent on the properties in a given map, you have to specify which map you're referring to. This becomes important in a moment when I show you how to make an inset map showing sort of the broader regional context for an area. Um, there's actually gonna be two map elements kicking around in this layout manager. And we wanna make sure our scale bar is reflecting the scale of the main map area, not the inset map. So again, map one here, if I wanted to, um, I could potentially, I, I just need to keep in mind that map one is the main map that I'm working off of that I'm concerned with. So once I'm happy that map one is the scale that I'm concerned with, there are a number of options made available to me by default on the type of scale bar that I could have. So for instance, line takes down the middle, that's nice and simple. Double box is one people tend to like. Um, I could click down and look at all sorts of other options. Pick whatever works for you. Um, I like double box in this case, that looks nice. So then the next decision we have to make is the scale bar units. Um, we know, again, thanks to our projection system, we know that things should be in meters. By default, this scale bar happens to be in kilometers, but if we so chose, we could render the units in meters. You might not be able to tell. There you go, hopefully you can see this now. So zero, 5,000, 10,000. If I go to kilometers, go zero, 5, 10. I could even do something of true unit conversion and go to miles. Um, again, because it knows the underlying scale of the area, it is doing the math really quickly to figure out what the relevant scale is. Now, the thing with scale bars that trips people up is, okay, you might not be happy with just a 10 kilometer scale bar. You might want a much bigger one. So when you scroll down this item properties menu, this is where you can start editing how many segments there are going to be. So for instance, if I just keep clicking up right all the way up to six, I can get up to 30 kilometers there, that, that's good. But let's say I'm not happy with that unit. I could change the spacing to four, to three. There are a range of different uh, elements there. And then I can even adjust, for instance, the height of the box if I want to make sure that this really stands out. And finally, I can add this background element here. I often like to do this with scale bars, it's just my preference. I think it helps it stand out against the backdrop of the map. But again, this is just a, an aesthetic preference. This isn't necessarily a hard and fast rule. If you wanted to actually edit the font size of a particular element, you could do so by accessing, let me see, this is actually, this is fun for me because this is something that Ah, there it is. So under this here, I think I could, yes. So and this is found under the, to edit the font size for these labels, it's still, it's under the display option here. And it's all the way at the bottom. This is very common in the layout manager in QGIS to edit the font of any particular label in the layout manager you're probably gonna to have to drill down to some deeper menu like this. And it just takes practice to figure out how you're gonna do that. 
I can also turn on a frame. All this does is add a, a box around the scale bar, um, which again, could help us aesthetically. Okay, so we have a north arrow, we have a scale bar. Um, before I add something like a legend, there's a few other things I could add to this, to this map here. Um, and, and one thing that we probably wanna have is some sort of grid, right? Uh, because a grid would actually give us some context on where we are on the map and gives future users access to underlying geospatial information, uh, particularly the coordinates of particular points on the map if we report the projection system, which of course we're going to do because we know what we decided on which projection system we're going to use. So we do this by clicking the plus sign here under grids. This is found under the item properties for the main map. When we click modify grid, again, this is where the fun comes in and I encourage you to explore. So I'm gonna keep this as solid going to use our project CRS. Map unit sounds great. And actually what I know for a fact is that two, three, four, there we go. So keep in mind what's happening here is I'm drawing this grid that is being defined by the intervals of map units. Um, ah, there we go. Um, map units in this case are meters, right? The meters are the unit for the SERGAS 2000 projection system. Um, so by entering an X of 10,000 and a Y of 10,000, uh, this is saying every 10,000 meters or every 10 kilometers, I'm gonna draw one of these grid lines. Um, now, I may not be happy with that. I actually think 20,000 looks a bit nicer. And this renders live, which is really nice. So you can see now I have a nice wide space grid that again, gives me reference points. If I need to georeference this map later for whatever reason, because the underlying data gets corrupted, or if I just want people to be confident about where we are in this area. Um, that's great. We wanna make sure that we also render this alongside some sort of con contextual frame. And so we can do this by scrolling further down in the grid, we have the option to add a frame. Uh, I personally really like the zebra option, but there are a number of different ways you could render this, some a bit cleaner, a bit more simplistic, and that's totally fine. It's really up to you. Um, if we go further down, we then, we don't just want to show this grid without any context. We want to show the actual coordinates. So if we click on draw coordinates, you'll notice that all of a sudden the coordinates corresponding to the easting and northing or the X and Y coordinates of our projection system render um, they don't look great though. The, the, the font is small. There's a decimal point where the probably doesn't need to be. We're actually just gonna leave a decimal for now because to edit that ends up being a pain. <laughs> um, but I encourage you to explore that on your own time. Okay, so. What we wanna do, so what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna make the decision that I only want the coordinates to display on the left and the bottom. I don't wanna clutter the map too much in the top and the right, because I have lots of other stuff that is gonna be going on there. So I can remove these coordinates from the top. I can remove them from the right. And then notice that over here, the coordinates are going off the screen, that's not okay. So for the left side coordinates, I want those to render vertically. And that even that isn't great, still, still not terrible, but you know, a bit misaligned, maybe not ideal for this particular use case. Um, but it's a starting point, right? You can, you can start editing this in your own time. All right, there's two more elements to add, and then I wanna call it for, for the evening. Uh, the first is, a legend. All right. Now, when you add a legend, you go to add item, you add legends. Legends are some of the trickiest bits to manipulate when you're making a map in GIS. And that's because when you add it, by default, it's going to add every single, <laughs> you see I've zoomed out here, every single layer that I have loaded in my project file gets dumped in here. And they're dumped in in the order and in the format that I have them in my layer dialog in the main map canvas. That's obviously a mess. 
So what you essentially have to do is you have to go through and manually, you need to, rem you need to first of all, turn off the auto update option under legends. You might want to give this a title, call that legend, sounds good. Turn off auto update. And what this lets you do is to, to edit essentially the labels here. So I could decide to remove all of these. I definitely don't need these. Under georeference, I know which ones I'm using. I'm using these particular layers. I'm not gonna do this for every single one because it just, it would be kind of a waste of your time and mine. There we go. So you can see I'm starting to sort of trim this stuff down with the landslide risk with the fluids. And as I go and I do this in more detail, you can see it starts to, to break this down. Now, I want to potentially change this Lahar layer. It now reads Lahar. Just by double clicking on it and going into legend item properties, I'm able to edit individual labels, which is nice. Now they, now they render as real names that humans read rather than sort of my more computer speak labeling scheme that I use for my layer naming. Um, we can also, for instance, under legends, again, this is quite a whirlwind tour here. There's a lot to, to touch on here. Um, you can edit the font size for, all, for the legend title all the way down to the subgroups and the individual layers. You can have multiple columns and this, this comes to be quite useful as we go. Um, I'm actually gonna continue to delete some layers so things look a bit nicer. There we go. So now we're starting to get a legend that's a bit more reasonable in size, but we'd still want to trim this down. We'd still want to remove some of these features, you know, especially the layers that aren't actually rendering in the map. We know we only have the DEMs, some of the hazard layers. Um, those are the only things that are actually showing up in the map. So those are the only things we're really gonna want to show up here. Um, and basically, the, once you have the legend the way you want it, and you're not gonna make any other changes, you never want to click this auto update again, because if I click this again, it's going to re-render everything as it appears in the map canvas. That allows you to reset if you, if you so choose, you know, in case you make a mistake. But if you reselect auto update, it's going to look to the map canvas, pull whatever is there into the legend, and you're going to have to start over. So that's something to keep in mind with the legend. I'm not going to render that here for you. The final thing, and this is, this is where uh, this is probably the trickiest thing to get your head around, but is very valuable, is an inset map. And I've actually had several people email me about this, wanting to know how to do this. It's a bit uh, unnatural the way I'm going to ask you to approach this, but just bear with me. So the first thing we're going to do is we're essentially going to create a second map view. Um, this starts by locking, oh, sorry, locking this particular map element here, map number one. By locking it, what this means is that we've essentially frozen in time our picture of the map canvas to when I click this lock option. And so long as I don't click it again, this stays frozen. Um, and I can do whatever I want to the map canvas and my layout view doesn't change. So I'm going to save my layout view. So I take a moment, go back here. And now if I go and I turn off everything, notice that this stays as it was, the pristine way we wanted it. That's good. So for my inset map, I just wanna show, for instance, I don't know, Ecuador at say this scale. Maybe actually I, I, I wanna show it using a different base map. I'm gonna talk about base maps a bit more in session four, so don't worry too much about this at the moment. Um, well, I'm actually gonna load in a different base map because I don't like how either of these look. Um, Let's try, let's see what Google terrain looks like. I hate that, that is not good. There we go, sure. Let's say that we're happy with that. So again, I wanna to zoom to the scale that I'm happy with. And I'm actually going to drag, uh, apparently just drag that into nothingness. <laughs> so, all right, 
just bear with me, sorry. It's, it's been a very long day. So we have this base map here that we're just gonna tolerate at the scale we want. So when I click add item, add map, and I draw a small box in the corner here, it's gonna render Ecuador the way I want it. Now, in this case, it's still not zoomed in enough. I don't wanna show that much of the neighboring countries. I wanna have a bit closer view of Ecuador. There we go. We can treat this the same as we did um, the larger map. And we can scale this down if we so choose accordingly. Now, this isn't ideal in some respects. Um, maybe we'd want to adjust. You can see already how this is an iterative process. Once you get one map the way you want it to look, you realize that given the bounds of the box that you're working in, I actually might want to zoom out a little bit so that these lahars aren't sort of being crossed over by this inset map. That would require me locking map number two here and then going back and editing map number one and then unlocking it and going back and forth, back and forth. It's not the most easy process. There are better ways of managing this, but this is sort of the basic way that you, you deal with an inset map. And now what you're probably asking is, that's great. How do I know where my main map is actually referring to? And this, again, under the item properties menu, there's a rich slate of tools at your fingertips. And right under grids for any map element, there's something called overviews. So if you click this and you add an overview, what this is gonna do is if you tell it which map frame it, you're, you're looking for an overview for, you click this, Notice it, it's very smart. It immediately knows, okay, I know what scale I'm at with map two. You've projected, you've given me enough geographic coordinates that I know where I am in the world and I know where map one is. So when you fill in map one for the map frame here under overview, it draws a box in this inset map where your field area is. This map, now this box by default doesn't look very nice. What, uh, what I often do as I go in, you see if you click directly on the box, it allows you to edit this directly. Um, I go in and I uh, actually make the fill transparent, but I, I personally really like to have uh, a stroke that is and this is where the, the fun happens because I Ah, there we go. Stroke style needs to be solid line. There we go. So once I have that, I have this nice solid red box. And in my figure caption in my paper, I could say, you know, see inset map, red box denotes the field area here. Um, and now once I'm happy with the inset map, again, I can just go back to item properties, scroll up to the top, and I can lock this. And then if I wanted to go back and edit map number one, all I'd have to do is unlock that once I get the map canvas looking the way I want it. So to do that, I'll just show you real quick, enable the hazards. Uh, this is gonna drive me crazy where I hid. Ah, there's the open street map. The danger of, of doing things quickly and not thinking about them. Um, so in the base layers, okay, I'm happy with that. Perhaps I zoom out a bit more, leaving a bit more room. There we go. See now what I've now what I've done is you see map two is locked. Um, even if I've completely removed all those layers, it still remembers where it was for so the bookmarks. It saves it as an image, and now I'm happy with that. So if I've added my legend, added everything else that I need, I can also add labels. So you can see I can add a text label here. Um, I, and this is how I add things like the 90 millimeter ash isopack layer directly to the map. Or I can add uh, from the text labels, I can add the box giving the hazard assessment, how many people are impacted. So with all these elements, and then once I'm happy with them, the way I finish this off is I go to layout, and under layout, there are three export options, export as image, export as SVG, and export as PDF. Now these options are, you know, which one you choose depends on your use case. Um, I often, for like a figure, for instance, if I know that I'm happy with the way the map looks and I, this is the end goal for me is just getting the map and I'm done with it now for, for the moment, um, I often export as an image. 
And when you select this, it's going to take a moment. Um, there we go. Uh, it's going to ask which format. You have a number of different formats you can choose from, which is nice to have that those sort of options. Um, but perhaps more useful for a lot of you is you can actually export this as an SVG or PDF file. Um, these file formats are, if you're familiar with graphic design softwares like Illustrator or Inkscape, are going to provide you with the tools you need, uh, sort of provide you with the layer structure that is reflected in your, in your items list here. So you will actually be able to manipulate individual layers um, in the map. Um, and perhaps improve the rendering. Um, so basically, if you wanted to take this map, and kind of make the basic look of it in QGIS, but you wanted to fiddle with some of the design elements, say you wanted to shift these and you didn't want to have to figure out, you know, how to shift these labels of the coordinates on the side, um, you could export this as an SVG, bring it into Inkscape or Illustrator, and then you could manipulate those as individual item uh, elements. Um, so then you just simply select this, export it, and you get a file. And now I know that my version there didn't look as good, um, but this is what my map historically has looked like. I saved this as sort of a time capsule of when I took the time to do this properly. Um, and you can see all the different elements I just discussed laid out here. The, the coordinates on the side with the grid, the inset map, the scale bar, the risk assessment uh, box, the different labels, the actual underlying layers, the legend. And when I'm happy, I hit layout, SVG, PDF, or image. And our long journey to get this map produced to make to help the Ecuadorian Volcano Observatory or the Ecuadorian government make a decision about what to do in the event of an eruption, we have reached the end of that journey now. Um, and now what happens after? Well, that's where. We have to use our critical GIS lens to think about what comes after this, what sort of assumptions we've made in making this map, and we perhaps need to come up with a strategy to communicate these uncertainties and potential ethical conflicts um, to our managers at large as we've now completed our project. So I want to thank you for taking the time to go through these supplemental lectures. As these lectures have gone, they've gotten longer and longer, and it's because there's so much material to cover, and I've barely scratched the surface with a lot of this stuff. I haven't given you, uh, I haven't given you everything you need, um, and that really comes down to the time constraints that we have uh, based on my own of time availability as well as the time constraints placed on the course itself. And that's okay. You know, I know you all have busy lives, and some of you may end up coming back to this. You may be listening to this now months years after I originally recorded this. I hope you found these supplemental lectures useful. I'll give a much more detailed wrap up uh, to this workshop at the end of lecture four on November 24th, 2021. Um, so for now, I'll just say uh, thank you for sticking with me through this. And I hope you've enjoyed these supplemental lectures. Have a great day.